Good evening and welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here. My name is Liza Dunn, and I'm the medical affairs lead for Bear Crop Sciences. I'm an emergency physician and a medical toxicologist, and lots of people wonder how an ER doc got into agriculture. What was the leap I took? Well, it's a direct result of doing relief work and realizing that malnutrition and insect-borne illness were the major burden for people in the tropics. Innovations in agriculture and vector control are two of the cornerstones of public health that have brought us an unprecedented increase in life expectancy by 30 years in the West. The Global South deserves the same access to the technologies that we've had that have made those uh, advances possible, those public health advances possible. This is why I'm delighted to um, sponsor this evening's symposium featuring Oxitec, one of the most interesting companies in who are developing groundbreaking innovations in vector control. As you might know, the number one, one, number one killer of man is worldwide is the mosquito. And tonight we're gonna to hear about some of the really interesting solutions for managing these insects in a sustainable and an environmentally friendly way. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our panel tonight. We're going to start with uh, Gray Franson, who was appointed to the role of Oxitech CEO in 2017. During his tenure, the company has expanded its public health and agricultural technology pipeline. It's upgraded its gene technology platform, established a new R&D collaborations, and strengthened core R&D operational capacity globally. Gray has served in a range of leadership roles in public and private sectors, focusing on advanced solutions to global challenges. Starting in 1999 as co-founder of his first early stage uh, technology startup at, while at university, Gray started or led companies in technology and biotechnology. During public service in the US government, Gray's roles included being the first chief of staff for the US Secretary of State's Office of Reconstruction and Stabilization, as well as positions focused on national security uh, priorities. Gray is a native of Seattle. Following Gray, we're going to have Kelly uh, Matson come up. And Kelly's the Chief Technology Officer. Kelly's responsible for the R&D division that produces and tests Oxitec's genetically modified species or insects, delivering new products into the commercial pipeline. Her team develops both the underlying genetics and engineering solutions required to scale insect production. She's also responsible for managing Oxitec's global operations, which includes insects manufacturing and quality in the UK, US, and Brazil. Kelly's background is in the technical development of genetically modified insects, which began during her PhD program at the California Institute of Technology, where she uh, earned her doctorate in biochemistry and molecular biophysics in 2012. She earned her BS in chemistry at Boston College in 2005. And then Kevin Gorman, who's the chief development officer for Oxitech. Kevin is responsible for generating new opportunities for Oxitech's technology and ensuring regulatory advances in compliance. Kevin has 30 years of experience as an agricultural and public health entomologist with a focus on integrated and sustainable, sustainable pest management practices. Kevin led Oxitech trials in Panama and in India with an emphasis on the mosquito vector uh, responsible for transmission of dengue, chikungunya, and Zika viruses. So with that, please enjoy your dinners and we'll take off. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for coming and joining us for some of our famous Northwest salmon and local brews. Uh, my name is Gray. Thank you very much uh, for the introductions. Thank you, Bayer. Uh, we've been in partnership with Bayer for, I believe, seven years now. Um, and uh, it's, it's been a, a wonderful relationship to this point, and this is a great example of it. So um, let's get to work. There's a lot to talk about tonight. Um, uh, I will say happy Halloween. Um, and um, I'm glad the weather is cooperating for us. It's a beautiful Seattle day. All right. Many of you know Oxitec already. I'm going to skim through uh, the, the basics just so you understand who we are. Uh, but then we want to get to the meat of the discussion tonight. First, of course, is the fact that uh, Oxitec is a biotechnology company that was formed in Oxford about 20 years and two months ago. Um, 
and we are now the first movers in advancing uh, bioengineered insects for purposes of controlling vectors and agricultural pests. First movers, um, and, and I'll walk you through just briefly the tech to make sure everyone knows what we're talking about, and then my colleague Ke uh, Kelly and Kevin will talk about, uh, about more of the technology in depth. So, we develop genetically modified mosquitoes and other pests. We insert two genes into a target mosquito to generate a self-limiting mosquito that allows us to release male Oxytec mosquitoes that then mate with wild-type female mosquitoes. All female progeny from that mating die. And accordingly, population suppression ensues very quickly. So, we're not new, and many of you know us very well. We now just, uh, as of two weeks ago, had another scientific publication uh, that was published um, that, that makes it well over 100 now. We've released over 1 billion mosquitoes to date into the environment. Um, many people don't know this, but everywhere we work, we have a significant level of public acceptance, public support, um, and that continues to grow in places like Florida, California, or Brazil. Uh, we're developing a range of technologies, not just mosquitoes. We're focused also on agricultural pests, big broad acre uh, agricultural pests, as well as uh, horticulture pests, which are exciting programs in the food security space. Tonight, we're talking about mosquitoes. We're talking uh, in a, about two mosquitoes in particular. One, we're gonna walk you through our malaria program that is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Kelly will walk you through, uh, especially our program on Anopheles Stevens Eye, which is an exciting program we're just celebrating now the commissioning of a new facility in Djibouti. She'll walk you through how we think about these programs uh, and how we kind of go from early to uh, deployment. Kevin's going to walk you through then um, the story of our, our 80s Egypti mosquito, um, which is what we're most well known for. It's certainly the farthest along, and, um, and we're really proud of it. So you'll get two real-world case studies. We are very open, we're very frank and direct, so our, our interest tonight is making sure we're laying out uh, a, a wholesome view for you, such that we can get to a, a very good question and answer session. Session, pardon me. We have about 30 PhDs working for us, 250 people right now on staff, uh, and a whole ecosystem of subcontractors, partner organizations, et cetera, around the world from 15 different countries. Okay. I love to start with this slide uh, when we talk about OxyTech because most people uh, do not appreciate the fact that thousands of people now and dozens of organizations uh, in government, private, nonprofit, charitable institutions have come together to form what is OxyTech today. The technology we're talking about today is made possible by uh, a wonderful coalition of parties that came together, in essence, to solve for the, what we're doing today isn't working, we need something new, how do we develop something safe and effective um, to move forward in the fight against malaria, for example? We're pretty experienced now. We operate around the world. Um, I'm not going to go into the fine print here. We'll make these available for you online. Um, but from a regulatory standpoint, uh, Oxitech also is, is extremely experienced, um, but now achieving full deregulation. Um, the monumental landmark decision in Brazil to fully deregulate two of our technologies are allowing us to move into this is real. And the reason I, I don't come and, and I don't speak often, and you'll probably see why in the next couple of minutes, um, but the reason I wanted to come here tonight was to share with you a very special moment that I believe is important not just for Oxytech, but for the broader vector control community. Um, and that is the fact that we have completed a very important circuit. We developed a groundbreaking self-limiting mosquito 80s Egypti. We advanced it through early trials, through regulatory approvals, through product development, manufacturing scale up, and we are now selling this product in Brazil to the public. And it's remarkable. In fact, just these last two weeks, we've now announced a nationwide scale up of this product. The reason I'm excited about this, of course, is because for me, I believe these, <laughs> we have a glitch here. Um, I'm going to argue to you that these are no longer novel technologies. These are needed technologies. And because I spend most of my time dealing with partners and, and the public, the press, um, I'm kind of getting tired of talking about novel technologies when, in fact, we have developed a complete solution 
ready for deployment at scale. And that's a big graduation mark for us, and I wanted to share with you some of the things. Let's start with the New York Times Magazine yesterday. I don't know if you saw it, but OxyTech was featured in a big headline climate change special. Um, it became available digitally last week. But I, I loved this article, because not just because they focused on, on OxyTech for a portion of it. But in the context of climate change and the need for new tools, this yellow quote in essence suggests that climate change is now, we know it's happening. The question now is how quickly can we adapt uh, and, and be resilient in a new environment? So it's less prevention, it's now full acceptance. And accordingly, with that context, um, there is big, there's a lot of consensus in our community. Um, first, that climate change is changing the way we have to combat vectors. I don't think anybody disagrees with this. The fights against dengue and malaria both are in the balance, and in fact, some would argue are going in the wrong direction. Current tools, I think we all agree, are not going to be able to, to, to reverse the trends and get to zero, say, for malaria. Um, and the current inventory of solutions right now is not going to be sufficient. Governments can't do this alone. They can't do this alone. It's been shown for decades now that while they play a, a most important role, uh, we need a broader coalition of organizations involved. And finally, I think we all accept that a, a new generation of tools is necessary. So, of course, the CEO of a biotechnology company is going to tell you that we play an important role in this, this new movement. So there's a couple of questions here. Um, if biotechnology is going to play a role and fill these gaps or help supplement or in fact lead new interventions, we have to be able to answer a few questions. First, can we significantly outperform existing solutions? Or can we complement existing solutions? Are we species specific? As in, are we specifically focused on a particular vector and then we have no other impact uh, on the environment or the ecosystem or other species? Uh, is the technology completely safe for humans and the environment? And can we inspire high levels of, of public acceptance or adoption? And so if we accept those as the core questions, um, we certainly would then start talking about, okay, so how do we make these real? How do we scale? So here we go. These are the big questions that we're solving for now, and then I'll, I'll zip you through a couple of the, the, the updates. Um, right now, OxyTech is focused on scale up. So we've built the strain, we know how to build self-limiting insects. Can we now scale these in product versions that can be manufactured efficiently at scale and deployed over thousands and thousands of miles? Uh, can we make them easy to use? So it's kind of, you know, some, for some folks it's science fiction, we're still think, thought of as experimental, but the truth is we've built now beautiful form factors um, that can be shipped and you can see a stack of them in the back um, and, you know, can we productize them? Can we manufacture them at scale and efficiently? Uh, we've learned this with bed nets, uh, of course, with chemistries. Um, OxyTech is working, in essence, to build the capacity to produce high-quality materials uh, consistently and at a low cost. Can we make it financially accessible? The previous three bullets would suggest that if we, if we get those right, then we certainly can drive prices down so that these types of technologies are no longer fanciful, uh, but in fact, ready to go and ready to serve communities that need them the most. And then finally, can we uh, inspire both acceptance and adoption? And guess what? Yes, we can answer yes to all of these. Surprise. Take a look. So this is, this is what we're really, really proud of. OxyTech is now building complete solution sets. I think a lot of people know OxyTech as an experimental R&D outfit coming out of sleepy Oxford. In fact, a few conversations tonight, I, I, I didn't know you guys were launching products already at scale. Um, that's okay. You know, we don't, we don't get out there enough to talk about uh, just how far we've come. So solution sets. Can we productize? Can we build the system around it? And can we ship? That's how we're going to have maximum impact. Can we build beautiful form factors? These, this is, uh, these are two mock-ups of the consumer product that will be launched in Brazil's leading grocery stores um, in just a matter of a month or so. Beautiful, simple, anyone can use it. Just add water. Um, pretty remarkable. Uh, we're just finishing now uh, a ginormous state-of-the-art facility in Brazil. I've invited a few of you to come down and visit us. Um, but um, in essence, we're solving for the can we build large-scale factories to produce 
uh, brilliant products at, at a high, high consistency. And finally, we are, we've built out um, really the, the world's largest distribution infrastructure for a biological control tool for mosquitoes. In this case, we can now ship products from our centralized facility thousands of miles across the Brazilian uh, landscape to deliver a high quality product to a community suffering from dengue. What about public acceptance? Um, again, something I like talking about. Um, if you read the salacious headlines about Oxitec or about my plans with Bill Gates to use mosquitoes to vaccinate people, um, it really belies the truth, which is Oxitec has generated exceptional levels of public support. And I'll call your attention to the, the kids here with little stamps on their arms. I don't know of many other large technology platform companies that have kids lining up to have stamps placed on their arm. It really is a wonderful example of how people have, have come to enjoy us. In Brazil, part of our national launch, we are, have built, uh, we focused on building a joyful experience. Um, again, you'll hear more about the technology, but um, as we envision how to inspire people to use, use these technologies in big urban landscapes like Sao Paulo or Rio, um, and you know, we have to think about how to, to, in essence, move beyond the science, and beyond R&D, um, to create something exceptionally joyful that people can, can buy into. And finally, we're, we're out and demand is rising rapidly. Um, we're going to have a growth problem here pretty soon, which is exactly the type of problem we like to have. Um, but we have built out a network of partners, uh, including a number of industry leaders. Some of the world's largest pest control companies are now signing on to distribute our products such that we don't have to, to re-engineer the last mile delivery element. This is a great picture here. This is Latin America's largest bus terminal. It has 90,000 people working, uh, moving through this facility. Um, they're now deploying our products and we're now being deployed in a number of other uh, Brazilian uh, public transport and airport facilities. So it's, it's really exciting. So all of this, a very, very short version of me saying, guys, this isn't novel anymore. We've arrived, a new genetically modified insect control system has been developed. And, um, and really, just the last two years, um, the, the, the conversation has begun to shift away from, can these technologies play a role, right? If they work, maybe they can, can, can have an impact. Um, the question now we're getting from partners, from governments globally, is how fast can you get this technology deployed into our country? How fast can you build a new solution? Again, a novel is Stephen's eye. We are full <laughs> pedal to the metal on the development program uh, to build this new, this new solution. But this is, this is the, the transformation I was hoping to share with you tonight. I'm asking you to join us in beginning to shift mindsets away from, it's still really, it's just r and I'm not sure it's gonna have impact. I'm not sure if it can be productized uh, or scaled because we, we've really solved them. And when we think about it together, Here's the math. Scaling these types of technologies, not just Oxitex, but the community of mosquito makers that we represent tonight, but of which we are only one, um, need to remind everyone of a few things. There is an urgent need, we all agree. Current tools are not going to be successful in getting to elimination. Um, we've proven their safety, we've proven their effectiveness, we've proven their large scale capacity and deployment, um, and we've proven public support. Now, we need to transition the mindsets. And so I'm glad you guys are here, salmon, alcoholic beverages, and, uh, and the message for you to take away that please help us. We're the, the farthest along. We're the farthest along by a good seven, eight, 10 years, depending on who you ask, as it relates to a biological control solution targeting a specific species of this type. And we need the community to begin changing its mindset and how it thinks through and advocates for these types of technologies. So whether it's us or Gene Drive or, or other tech, um, let's make the question really about how quickly um, can we move these solutions to market rather than if or well, we haven't, we haven't seen enough. Okay, so that's it. Um, we're going to now talk with Kelly, uh, who's going to walk you through, like, like I said, the malaria program, then Kevin. Thank you, guys. Kelly, welcome. Hi, guys.
guys, and after Gray has gone big, 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 um, I'm going to go small for a few minutes and take you to how do we start, how do we develop these tools, and how do we know, we know where we're going, what the endpoint is. So again, many of you have probably seen publications, but I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on what the genes are, what are we actually doing, how does our tool work. All right, so Gray talked about two genes, and I'm going to start by talking about the self-limiting gene, because I can show you the marker gene in one slide with one picture next. So our self-limiting gene is important because it gives us two things. One, it allows us to suppress populations in the field, as Gray talked about. We release, you get males only, but it also gives us a manufacturing tool. So along the bottom here, what you see is that we've taken genes from the mosquito and just plugged in this TTAV. And what that lets us do is to switch on and off the expression of this gene, specifically in females. And so in the laboratory or in the factory, I rear with this antidote, this gene is off and I get males and females. And we can produce mosquito eggs specifically at very large scale so I can manufacture cost effectively. But then when I put them outside, you add eggs, you add water, you don't add this antidote and what you get is a cohort of males. The males can go out, they can search, find these females. There's nothing better for finding a female mosquito than a male mosquito. And then when she lays those eggs, you get only males. So this leads to population suppression over time. So this is kind of the gene doing the magic and we use this in our whole portfolio. So whether you're talking about a mosquito, whether you're talking about a moth, it's genes engineered in this way. Here's the marker. Track and trace is important to us. It allows us to work in the field. It allows regulators to say, yes, you can see it, you can find it, you can see where it's going. Um, it's a very powerful tool for us, but also for everyone to see. This is the Octatech mosquito versus a wild type mosquito. So these are our two genes in every one of our products that we're working on. And what we've developed really, I think what sets us apart and allows us to do pest after pest is to have a product development process that's very defined. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about Stevens Eye. Stevens Eye has come through feasibility and it's into discovery. We have a TICS program that's still in feasibility. And then Kevin's gonna talk about 80s Egypti that's all the way over in launch. So each of our products moves through these stages and we therefore have validation points that say, yes, this is working. There's someone that needs it at the end. We understand what the use case is, but also the parts are working time after time after time. And so this, has allowed us to say, mosquitoes, all right, sure. Ticks, why not? Flies, yes, we have products in this space. So we use this pipeline as a way to make sure we're always working on things that can get to this product endpoint, that can have impact, and that will be you know, exceedingly useful for whoever the customer is. And so we're focused on a couple of areas. Today, we're obviously here to talk about health. There are a number of mosquito-borne diseases that are very important. But the same platform, these same genes, can have a really big impact in food security, can have an impact in livestock rearing in, in needful communities. So we think that we have a, a tool. It's not perfect for everything. You know, not every pest you come to me with will be the right one. But we have a way to evaluate and then a way to engineer and to make products. Gray mentioned already today, we've just published a paper on OX5034, which is our 80s Egypti product, um, and Kevin's gonna talk a little bit about the data from that paper, but it's really nice to see these things come into the public domain. And what we try to do is always move our, our data into the public so that people can see, they can understand how we get to these endpoints, what the strengths are, how they're developed, and then how they perform in the field. So I think we feel that we need to continue to be open to generate this acceptance that Gray is talking about, to make sure people understand what they're signing up to and that they can see the same kind of things the regulators can see at the same time. So this has really been a powerful tool for us, and you'll continue to see us publishing, um, although I will just in a few minutes share some new malaria-relevant data. We'll talk about Stephen's eye. So over the last couple of years, we've really been fortunate to enter the malaria space. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been exceedingly generous to underwrite this program. Um, and we're working on two species. But today, I'm going to talk about Stephen's Eye specifically, because that's something where we know we can have a real impact in communities that, that need support. They're having a new invasive problem. So one of the first things we do is we say, how is this tool going to work in the landscape of tools that are already there? So we talked about suppression, and all of our insects are oriented around a suppression phenotype. And the graph on the left is showing you nothing more than the more you release, the quicker you can control your population. So that won't be a mystery to anybody who's looked at anything from Oxitec before. But on the right-hand side is something that's maybe a little bit less well-known. Because our males 
can give rise to a next generation of males. And those genes are self-limiting. They decay over time, but they do have a couple of generations where they persist. We can actually benefit other tools that are out there. So what we can do is we can dilute out or control the rise of resistance to tools that already exist in the market. And what that allows us to do is to extend the lifetime of these tools. And when you use them in combination with our insects, you actually get a much more powerful effect. And so this is what you know, Gray was talking about, where our tools need to fit in to what's going on and have you know, outstanding performance. And so when we look at the modeling for Stevens Eye, we can look at nets. Nets might not be actually a really effective tool for Stevens Eye, but some of the spraying will be. So it doesn't really matter what your mode is. As long as there's a resistance that arises, we can help participate with those tools that have an impact. So while this is talking about spraying, you can think about any tool to which the mosquito learns to evade. So it's a very, very powerful effect for us. Just to put you in the picture of what, what our second species is on malaria, we're also looking at Anopheles albumanus. So Anopheles albumanus is spreading malaria in Mesoamerica. Um, it's, it's been difficult to just sort of eradicate, to finish the job in some of these areas because of this mosquito. So we're, we're starting a program there. It's a little bit behind our Stevens Eye program that I'm going to focus on today. Because Stevens Eye is so invasive, because it's showing up in urban centers where we previously haven't had malaria. It's, it's generated quite a lot of rightful alarm about what's going on. And so we think we can bring something to the party here that we can make a real difference. And as with Aedes aegypti, we're not focused on just making a strain. So that is what my team are working very hard on right now. We're at this point of just trying to generate these strains, but that is not to be done in isolation. And it's not to be done in, in series either. We're working in parallel to generate the rearing solutions that we need, things that can be implemented in country. We're working about what does this look like as a product? It's not gonna look exactly the same as a 5034 product, but we're thinking about that today before we even have a strain in hand. And then developing tools with Aedes aegypti, with our agricultural pests that can be expanded and then work in this malaria space as well. So this platform will be developed fully in parallel and so that it's ready to go as quickly as possible. All of this work is always done in partnership. So we're, we're just getting off the ground in Panama, but in Djibouti, we're ver working very closely with Mutualis. Um, they've been an amazing partner, um, and it's, it's just wonderful to sort of get on the ground um, to go, if you look carefully, some of us are in this picture, um, and to just really get a feel for what these communities are up against. And the need, I think many of you know, the need is only getting bigger. So Stephen's Eye is kind of a frightening situation right now in the sense that it's filling a niche that we didn't really know was even there. It's coming into these urban centers and so many people are at risk from malaria that previously didn't have to really think about this. This wasn't part of their landscape. Millions of people, hundreds of millions of people potentially are living in these urban centers that are vulnerable to invasion and it's starting to be detected. So when we first started this program, the thought was it's in the horn, maybe we can keep it, maybe we can push it out and already it's starting to be detected across this band. And that is something that Oxitec's thinking about. How do we move faster? How do we start to defend some of these centers? One of the first things we do, though, is we say, what do we actually know about this vector? And unfortunately, Stephen's eye is a little bit of a black hole. There is some literature, and it's coming on quickly. But what we did is we started working on the ground with Mutualis to look at mosquitoes. What is Stephen's eye actually doing? And what you see here are data from 12 months of monitoring. We monitored in different kinds of locations, urban centers, more rural areas, and, and villages. We watched the climate. And you can see what you would predict, but still, it's nice to see the data coming in, and it gives us a baseline of what's going on, right? There's a very, very short low season for this mosquito. It's only at the driest point in the year when we don't see it represented. And the rest of the year, it's actually quite high prevalence. When it rains, up it comes. So while not shocking, this is one of the best data sets that we think is out there in terms of what's happening on a local scale. Um, and what this does is it generates a baseline for us. When should we start? When should we treat? Where should we look? We didn't know if we would see it everywhere, but we have. So it gives us a lot of opportunities for the next stages in our program. This is a very, very hands-on bit of work. Um, we have, we've had a guy in our team, Morel, he's been just a hero, getting out there, working with this team, figuring out how to trap. Um, we've been very successful with our traps in detecting Stephen's eye week after week. Um, and it's just, the team is just fantastic out there. We've also done a little demo and then a little building up. So we've got a lab facility coming together and this will host our next piece of work, um, which is gonna be mark release or capture. 
So I'm going to close by just saying our next step is it's a wild type study, but we're going to measure how big the population is. We're going to understand how these mosquitoes are moving in these landscapes, and that's going to make, um, the, you know, lay the ground for our next stage, which is to start thinking about getting a modified Stevens eye out there as quickly as possible. And so that's, a, that's our early research story. That's how we get started. And I'm going to hand over to Kevin now, who's going to take you through 5034, going commercial. Super. Uh, thanks, Kelly. And uh, thanks, Gray. Um, you've heard from Gray about you know, why we need these tools, um, where we are in that journey uh, you know, on a whole. And you've heard from Kelly about um, our, our work on the malaria side and a little bit more detail about how these actually work. Um, as Kelly mentioned, um, it's the same for Aedes aegypti as it is for the Anopheles in terms of exactly how it works. And what I'd like to do really is talk a little bit about Aedes aegypti, uh, use it as a case study so that you can understand the breadth of work that's been required to get that from the lab out through to a commercial product that Gray's been talking about. So really, it's a, a potted journey, if you like, um, across that, uh, that, that timeline of, of what is about 20 years now. And this slide really just shows you where we are today, if you like. We've got a product out there in Brazil, as Gray has described. Um, it's coming up th uh, through the system in other countries. And it goes out to the public. It goes out to governments. It goes out to businesses uh, alongside a digital app, a kind of funky, you know, customer-focused app, which can can accompany that product and make it easy to use. It really, really changes the way that a vector control tool looks, feels, and, and, and is deployed. This slide shows really that history in one uh, quick timeline. Now, this is Aedes aegypti. We've had a couple of flavors of Aedes aegypti over the years. Um, this goes back to 2009, 2010, when that first deployment happened. That's the far left-hand side as you look, uh, that small blue circle, if you like. The blue circles represent our first uh, generation of Aedes aegypti, and it was about 2018 when we transcended to this female-specific or male-selecting product that Kelly's been describing and Gray's been describing. Uh, that allows us to put it, these eggs into a box and allows them to be, be deployed by anybody uh, without any technical real skill or, 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 or know-how. Um, over those years, uh, since then, we've, we've done a, a range of, of studies, uh, initially in Brazil, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about a couple of those, and then into the US, um, and some really pertinent work that's been going on over the last couple of years. We've had really good suppression figures throughout that, be it the first generation or the second generation. This is a technology that works. Uh, it, when it's put in the right hands, um, this is a technology that really can produce great results in terms of su suppressing or reducing a vector population. Gray mentioned we've released over a billion of these mosquitoes now. So it's, it's a, it's a while since we hit that milestone. It's a lot of mosquitoes, and of course, never one adverse effect noted during all of that uh, history of, of, of field releases in various continents and lots of countries. I'd just draw your attention to that one large blue circle on the right-hand side of that, just on the left-hand side of that box there. That was our largest first-generation trial. 65,000 people covered in a multi-year study, year-on-year -year suppression of well over 80%, and peak suppression uh, it well into the 90s. You know, it's a large project, and, and that was with our old tech. This new tech, uh, you know, is advanced, more advanced uh, in terms of its performance, but really in terms of its efficiency and the way that we can deploy it. I won't talk too much about safety uh, because um, we've, we've been there a lot, and, uh, you know, we're hoping to stimulate a lot of questions today for a good discussion, so... Uh, we won't dwell on that, but just to say that this is a technology that has an incredibly benign environmental profile. Uh, it's so species-specific. We even target just the females of a species these days. Um, and uh, it's one that really doesn't leave any footprint in the environment. So once we've finished releases, you know, within just a few generations, um, the environment, you know, there is no evidence that we would have been there, apart from the fact that we've reduced a, p a potential uh, pest population. 
I'll come on to a couple of those circles now as I go through the next few slides. And I'll start with that first small green circle, uh, the 96% just after the box there uh, on the right-hand side of the box. Uh, that's the publication that's just come out that uh, Kelly referred to. Uh, and this particular uh, study, this was the first time we'd released um, what were the, the insects that, that come out of this box. Uh, at that point, they were coming out of cages. We were releasing them as adults as opposed to from this product. Uh, it was the early stages as we came from that first generation, which used to be a, a male and female uh, product. Now it's just females, and this was our first look-see. Those chart, that chart there that you can see with the various lines, they, there's different doses there, a low and a high dose, and two of each, and they were replicated. And you can see we got really good control, um, whether it was low or the high dose. That low dose um, wasn't actually low enough uh, to, 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 to perform you know, uh, anything but optimally. So we could go a little bit lower than that, as it turned out. But this was the early days. We had uh, 100 mosquitoes per person per week at that low dose. We had about 300 at the high dose. And because they were working so well, we almost got no difference between them. These are tiny little urban areas, very densely populated, right in the middle of Indiatuba City in Brazil. And that is a picture of Indiatuba at the bottom there. Um, very dense neighborhoods, um, a hectare or so um, for the quadrants in the city, and, uh, and, and well over 100 people in each of those. So very dense, very threatened by dengue, and we got control you know, on these small scales, which was pretty unique. Uh, a lot of people used to think that these kind of technologies really had to be done over an area-wide scale of, of however big. Uh, and what we showed here was that you can really get this very, very localized indeed. So great suppression. Uh, the reference there is at the bottom, but um, uh, the slides will be provided, so you can always go and hunt that paper out. Uh, it's, as I say, uh, a, a good paper. It takes the strain all the way through to the field. On to the second trial uh, in that sequence, and now we're putting the, uh, the eggs into the box and letting those males come out on their own. So this was a, a just dud water trial, if you like. We've now putting the, the, the whole piece together, the eggs, the food, the diet, uh, and, the, and the water into a box and letting those males do the work for us. <clears throat> Again, in Indiatuba, uh, at this time, uh, we had an incredibly fast effect, uh, faster than we would have had with our adult releases. And at this point, we started to realize that you know, these sensitive releases, these males can now come out of the box whatever time of the day they like to come out of the box. They can come out right into the depths of the, of, of the environment. Whereas when we're doing adult releases, we were shaking them out of the back of a vehicle at 9 o'clock in the morning or whatever our operations dictated. Those more sensitive releases seem to be really helping those mosquitoes establish and, 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 and give us the effect that we were looking for. Within 14 weeks, we were at 90% control in this particular study. This data, uh, both sets contributed to the commercial approval that we then subsequently, subsequently got in May 2020 uh, from CTM Bio. That's the biosafety regulator in Brazil. This gave us the permission to do releases anywhere in the country without further restriction or permit. Um, this really was an amazing landmark because now we were free to actually put this in, in the hands of the people. We couldn't do it immediately because we needed to scale up and we needed to perfect the manufacturing and make sure that we were uh, prepared to get this, make this accessible in the way we needed to. But this was the key to opening the door to the launches that we've seen more recently and the place we are today. On to the US then. So now we're talking uh, 2020, in fact, we got the approval from the, from, from the EPA in the US to do trials in Florida and as it was in Texas at the time. We started in 2021. There was a slight delay for COVID and other things as we prepared for those studies. And in 2021, we got going with a, with a project in, Florida, in the Florida Keys. Very sensitive environment. Great partner we have there in the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District. Um, 
you know, a groundbreaking project again uh, for us, and of course with a regulatory system behind us there, you know, uh, that is incredibly strong, um, a really robust, uh, a strong dossier provided, a two-year review uh, to get us to this point of approval, and now we were free to go ahead and get that project underway. We had two different um, arrangements for that project. We had a multi-site study, a multi-point study where we were looking at neighbourhood-sized releases, and then some single-point releases as well, looking at what that might do for an individual homeowner in their backyard and what kind of effect that might give them. We had some great outputs. Um, of course, no females released is something that a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, wanting to make sure was the case. And from a regulatory perspective, it was very important. Not only did we not release any females because of this technology, which is a 100% uh, penetrance, as we call it, or efficacy, we also didn't have any females coming through in the field. Over 22,000 larvae uh, were reared up from eggs, and every one of them taken to adulthood, and every one of them females that was fluorescent died when it was at a young larval stage. So a great, um, a, a great tribute to the technology and, 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 and a supplement to the data that we produced in Brazil. We got good dose rates. Uh, those dose rates were suitable for getting us uh, a good mating fraction, as we called it. That's a good level of fluorescence in the population. That marker allows us to tell if we're performing well or performing not so well, and then we can up or lower the release rate to make sure that we're nice and efficient. Our males were getting out there dispersing and they were mating well, you know, uh, and again, you know, what we'd seen in Brazil, we didn't expect anything different, but it was nice to see that happening in the Florida Keys environment. And one thing that we did in the Florida Keys was, was to look at cryptic sites. What we wanted to see is make sure that our males were, were accessing those sites that are difficult to find with an insecticide if you're spraying, for example. And sure enough, no matter whether it was tires, whether it was plant pots, whatever it was, we found our, our fluorescent insects in there showing that we were accessing all breeding sites no matter how deep into their local environment they were. All of these projects, uh, you know, goes without saying, and Gray touched on it at the start, you know, it's partnerships and it's partnerships right down to the community level that are absolutely vital for us. Um, we couldn't do this kind of work without them. Um, we get really integrated into the communities. We go to all the local events. We, you know, we, we train people. We give them lectures. We do monthly webinars. But we, most importantly, listen. Uh, we try and understand exactly what, um, what their concerns are, what their likes and their preferences are. And then we try to blend that project to make sure that it suits their lifestyles. Um, and it's a, an approach that really works. In the Florida Keys in 2021, we had 570 families who'd actively participated in the project. And that's not just being in the vicinity with their home, that was actually having equipment on their, on their property. So that could have been release boxes releasing mosquitoes, or it could have been our traps measuring the effect of those mosquitoes, male mosquitoes. So a really strong integration in the community and a real great uptake. And that, can, that support continues to this day. We're typically always oversubscribed. So when somebody drops out, we just pick up the phone to the next one on the list and we can replace them straight away. Uh, it's something that you don't often hear about in the press. You often hear about some of the more controversial aspects. But on the ground, whether it's Brazil or whether it's Florida, we have amazing support. With that, you know, I'd like to just uh, finish with this one picture, you know, a, a great picture, one that we've shown a lot, you know, of a, of a couple of kids in, in Brazil looking at the male mosquitoes and uh, in a shopping center, you know, uh, it's, it's something that we've done often and, um, you know, really, I, I guess, uh, um, just shows what kind of um, level of, of connection we have with the public uh, during some of these projects. And I think with that, I'll pass back to Liza and we can get on with the discussion. Working? Yeah, there we go. Thank you, everybody. Um, and that was really, really fascinating. Uh, we'd like to invite anybody who has any questions to come up. In the meantime, while we're waiting, I've got a couple of questions here. Um, Gray, 
What are some of the things OxyTech has done to transform itself from a largely R&D organization to an organization commercializing groundbreaking technology? Well, thank you, and thanks again for, for being with us on this late evening. Um, so OxyTech, um, for the first 10 years of its life, was uh, a real R&D-focused uh, organization, for sure. In fact, that's all it really knew how to be. Um, and it took 10 years to build the, the technology platform that we are, are currently seeing now. The next five years uh, were focused on proving to the world that this is a technology platform that was safe and effective um, and that could work. And Kevin, again, talked about some of the, the, those early performance um, results. But the last five years really have been about transitioning an organization into one that has the capacity um, to scale at a global level. And that required us to do a few things. First, um, be less enamored with our own technology and be more focused on the impact that we seek to have with the communities that we, we seek to serve. Um, it, it's, it's oftentimes the, a challenge for innovative organizations to kind of step back and recognize that um, you know, we have a purpose, we have a mission, and we want to change lives for the better. How do we do that? How do we do that? So from our planning processes now, we kind of start with the end, the impact we seek, and we build uh, backwards um, in building our strategic plans, um, generating the resources necessary, and then ultimately building beautiful products that can scale um, of the type you've just seen. The second is culture. Um, we have transitioned our organization to one that places trust at the center of all we do. Um, I, I call it the trust equation, but for an organization like this, um, and you know, for us to have impact where we want to have impact, we must generate uh, a deep and sustained trust with those we seek to serve. To do that, we've got to be a trustworthy organization inside. So uh, on our executive leadership team meetings, um, on a weekly basis, trust is on the agenda, and we talk through how to be uh, an organization of, of the utmost integrity inside so that we can provide um, this amazing technology to the world in a trusted fashion. A couple of thoughts. Kelly. It looks like Oxytex has mastered the strain development process. What excites you most as it relates to technology scale up? Yeah, so um, I've had the privilege of working with a variety of different kinds of scientists. My background's molecular, um, and so I always loved that stuff. And it's been a real stretch for me to get into this rearing space. Um, and I, I just love to watch our team sort of problem solve. We, you know, we have a guy on my team, a different Neil than the one you guys have met here tonight. You know, he's, he's watching his fish, he's watching his plants grow, he's figuring out how seeds germinate, and he's, he's just drawing from every field that he's touched in his life and, and bringing that into a space that says, okay, I need to make, you know, a billion mosquitoes. How are we gonna do that? Okay, now today we're gonna think about moss. Tomorrow it's ticks. So just watching the variety of things that come together and how some of these really talented scientists are really created in this process. I, I just, it's wonderful. That's so interesting and exciting. And speaking about all the bugs, you sort of think about <laughs> Halloween and creepy crawlies, right? <laughs> so, Kevin, when will the Aedes aegypti solution be made available to the public in the U.S.? Just checking it's working. Um, great question. Uh, I, th you know, we, we have a trajectory and um, it's a little bit case by case. You know, we have a federal approval to get and then we have state approvals. So, so it depends on which state you live in as to whether you would need it, but also as to how soon it would arrive on your doorstep. Um, but, you know, the, the long and short is that, you know, from t the end of 2024 onwards, we could be making this available to people in the U.S. Um, and um, as I say, state by state, but that would be our, our goal from the end of 2024. And is there a certain state that you're seeing most promise as, as of the first state? Um, right across the southern US, uh, and even now uh, up both sides, it's starting to become a really big problem there too. Um, Florida has often been sort of seen as the gateway for this insect to be coming in and, um, and, and spreading disease as well. Um, 
but more and more, it's affecting other states too. It's, it's on the rise, um, uh, you know, as I say, right across the south, penetrating deeper and deeper uh, up the sides. And, um, and so, um, yeah, there's a lot to go at and a lot of people to help. Kelly, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but are there Anopheles mosquitoes that are making appearances in the U.S.? I think there are, but not so many that we worry about disease spreading just now. I mean, I think climate change is a, is a big wild card. Um, in, in the U.S., screens are a really powerful tool. So I don't anticipate there being huge disease impacts right now. But again, anywhere you establish these new vectors, there, there's a risk. So um, right now, no problematic anopheles that I know of, although there are experts in this room that could probably answer that question much more clearly than I could. Question. Uh, <clears throat> my name is actually Gray as well, Gray Hepner. I'm with uh, Crozet Biopharma. We make vaccines, but I'm always interested in vectors for uh, malaria. So, uh, two questions. Firstly, how many different species or subspecies are you developing mosquitoes? You mentioned uh, anopheline mosquitoes. So, are you looking at various categories of anopheline mosquitoes? And secondly, have you achieved eradication in an area or how close have you come to eradication? I'll go first. Um, so it, in terms of Anopheles, we're working on two species specifically, Anopheles albumanus and Anopheles stevens eye. Um, those aren't the only two species we could work on, but that's where we're starting. Um, and then in the Aedes space, we are working currently most with Aedes aegypti, but also um, Aedes albopictus in the past. I can talk about eradication as well. So our, our target is not eradication, um, although it would be possible in some settings. So places like islands, you could get eradication and then defend them. Certain of the cities that are vulnerable to Stevens Eye, you could think about defending potentially or pushing out if they're just early establishment. Um, but it would take big concerted efforts to really push things out. I know it has been achieved previously with things like DDT, um, but we're starting mostly with just getting tools that can be effective in communities that need them most. Thank you. It's nice to meet another gray. That is rare, very <laughs> rare. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Hi, Lyle. Yeah, uh, hi, Lyle Peterson from CDC. I have two questions. Um, one question is, what does this cost? Like, for example, to reduce Hades gypti by 96% in a population, let's say, of 100,000 people. I mean, how much money are we really talking about? And the second question is, I'm having a little trouble figuring out how a consumer product would work. I mean, some individual putting out a box here and there, I can't see how it would be very effective, but maybe you have some data on that. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, so cost is going to vary um, for individual, um, for, for government-wide interventions, it depends on a few things, as you'd imagine. So size of the deployment, the nature of the deployment. Uh, the pest pressure uh, that exists in, uh, at the start, um, and a num number of other uh, kind of fashions. So for the U.S. landscape, Lyle, I know we've had this discussion before, we're not yet ready to, to advertise a price per person because we have to wind through a number of elements over the next 24 months as we prepare, uh, in essence, to provide the, a, a pricing schedule, in essence. In Brazil, our prices are posted online, and you can, uh, if you were in Brazil, you could purchase a product right now. Um, and really, uh, I'll respond in a blanket way to suggest that um, we want to break the price floor where many of these technologies have been stuck, and that relates to the reason why we belabored the transition from first generation to second generation. Our first generation mosquito was groundbreaking, but it was also a wreck. It was never going to scale effectively. And we proved that because we built a giant facility uh, and ultimately could never make it work from an economic perspective or from a performance perspective. We had to rear and separate and then release males out of vehicles. And if you think about that, that means you can't centralize production in an efficient manner. You have to have all of these uh, smaller uh, um, production systems and then be tied to, you know, a hundred mile radius if you're lucky from that facility. It was never going to work. And I think uh, it was a, my first trip uh, down to Brazil once I took this job. I think, Kelly, you were with me. It took me 15 minutes to, to, to figure out that, that uh, a, a giant facility really was never going to make it. So we closed it. What we did is 
engineer inside the genome the ability for us to pull out 90% of a production requirement. So 90% of the complexity in producing what you saw here um, is eliminated, and thus we would pass that savings on directly to those that we would seek to serve. So I know I keep a uh, generic answer roughly, but I will note that for other mosquito-based technologies, um, we are the only ones that have been able to engineer out that 90% complexity uh, by placing it into the genome. Sorry. Great talks. Um, oh. that was, yeah. And Seal, sorry, that's right. Lyle asked one question about the single point uh, release. So consumers, yeah, we, we anticipate that through a, a rhythm of deployments that we guide on the app, um, that a single uh, property that meets a certain criteria will have some suppression effect in and around the area. Um, Aedes aegypti, as you know, um, fly not so far. They want to stay, stay close to humans. We piloted this last year with consumers uh, in Brazil, and it was a success. We now have people signing up uh, for yet more uh, years of, of involvement with us. But the big story really isn't about consumer. The big story is about commercial, large-scale employers in Brazil who right now, today, are discounting up to 5% of their labor productivity on account of dengue absences. So right now, we just, uh, we'll make some more announcements. Corteva now is deploying our technologies in their big sites. Um, Baker Hughes, GE, large petroleum companies. Every day, the customers are now coming in um, all seeking to do an area-wide deployment around these large-scale facilities, malls, airports, ports, parks, etc. So it's, it's going to be a busy year. Great talks. Um, hopefully this is something you haven't mentioned before. Um, is there any um, particular time in which these uh, male mosquitoes are released? And um, I mean, is this all over the years, or is there a specific time? And the other is if you are considering using um, um, this oxid tech in another countries, I mean, other than Brazil. So I'll first start about when do we release. Um, the, the best time to start a deployment is when you know they're coming. So getting out right when the season's going to start, that's sort of the most cost effective way. But you can start a release anytime. So if, if you come into a country and they're in high season, you can go straight out and, and use them. So it is a seasonal product, um, but that season will vary um, by your rainy season, by your climate, um, and every, every vector control community will know when's the right time to get Aedes aegypti out there. And Kevin, I'll let you talk about where else we're going. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Kelly. And, and you know, just to add, if you know, our, our male mosquitoes are the same as the wild ones in that you know, if the environment is suitable for the wild ones, it's suitable for our males. And so uh, um, you know, they, can always, they can always perform well. Um, in terms of where else, um, we're, we're at the point now where we're ready to scale. Um, so we're looking at a whole range of countries. You know, we're, we're looking at countries that have a real need. Uh, they could be countries uh, who are very threatened by dengue, um, of course, or, or chikungunya or yellow fever or any of the others that this, this mosquito um, transmits. And of course, you know, LATAM, Asia, you know, are prime territories, if you like. Um, uh, of course, it needs to have a regulatory um, pathway, which is workable, um, and so not all countries fit uh, currently, but um, for those that do, you know, we're now opening our doors and, uh, and exploring. So um, watch this space, um, but there's uh, quite a lot of countries on the list that are, that are open to us and that we're talking to. Mark Benedict, CDC. Hey, Mark. I, my question is probably for Greg. And it uh, relates to the, uh, the use of the term scalability in terms of the business plan of Oxitec. Mm -hmm. I mean, on one hand, you have urban areas, especially places like Brazil, where the people have enough income that they can afford these interventions, mm -hmm. which seems to me eminently scalable. On the other extreme, though, it seems to me a mosquito like Anopheles albumanus, which is not going to have much significance in urban areas, it's going to be rural, and it's highly mobile in, in contrast to Aedes aegypti. Uh, so do you think that's stretching the business concept of Oxitec to produce scalable 
solutions because it seems to me that's, that's pushing the technology and the use of the term scalable off the edge of the cliff. Could you respond to that? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Great question. Um, so uh, we touched on the fact that um, uh, the OxyTech technology really is a platform technology. That's a bit of a, uh, an overused term in today's tech world. Um, but in essence, our gene platform works in any number of pest targets that we would pursue. So we're unique in that. The reason that benefits us and the reason why we have diversified now our development pipeline to include a few different agricultural pests, a livestock pest, and now uh, multiple mosquitoes uh, is because this helps us blend, in essence, a, a financial model that allows us to generate self-sufficiency and a lack of dependence on, on donors um, in high-end markets or in commercial markets. Uh, in the agricultural space, for example, we're, we're preparing to scale a technology that focuses explicitly on commercial BT crops in, in certain countries. Um, that allows us then to provide um, not only economies of scale as we build every subsequent pest with Kelly's teams, you know, every new pest we add, her team grows, the number of robots and weird things that she has in her labs, when she lets me take a look inside under the hood, um, it just grows, our expertise grows, the efficiency uh, through which we push a certain technology into a product form all grows, shrinks the time to market, reduces the cost of the overall investment required, and then it allows us to take a product to market ideally at a competitive price, in commercial markets that will help us offset where we have to support or underwrite. You know. Okay, I, I buy that. What I don't buy is that there is enough uptake on the consumer side for a, an albumanus type application. Oh, oh, yeah. No, no, that's not the model for albumanus. Apologies, I missed the point. You're absolutely right about albumanus. We're developing albumanus because we've been asked to. And we're going to provide this. Okay. There you go. That's the specific okay. clear answer for you. <laughs> Sometimes asking is enough. Uh, that's right. That's okay, a, thanks, great Brian. question. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Mike Terrell. Uh, first of all, this is unbelievably exciting. My one semi concern is that was sort of mentioned that this gene will eventually disappear after several generations. So you get this 90, 95% reduction in the Egyptian population. Everything is wonderful, but that. 5% that's left maybe a year later, since the environment is still there, still very conducive to Egypti, it will come back. One of the semi-problems you're going to have is because the Egypti population is now so low and there's so little disease, can you get the interest back in again to knock it down before it comes back up high, becomes a pest again? Yeah, great question. Great question and one we get often. Um, and one a question that our colleagues in the, say, indoor residual spraying or bed net departments um, certainly have to respond to as well. Um, you know, the, the, we are not aiming for elimination and we're not aiming for a permanent change to a <coughs> pest species presence, as in we're not trying to permanently change genes in an existing population or remaining population. Um, and we definitely do not want to um, advertise elimination or eradication. We can't do those things from a regulatory standpoint, most importantly, um, and to help us distinguish ourselves from certain other gene technology programs that are attempting to permanently alter the environment. We are taking a, a different approach. So that means that like other tools, we have to be used um, and deployed in a methodical fashion in the public health context. That means um, an intervention program of the type that Kevin laid out will include a larger deployment or more dosing up front, and then we'll, we'll drop or reduce to um, a far more um, reasonable or minimal uh, deployment profile. That's the case for every technology in this building during this conference, and I think we're not shying away from that because the <coughs> alternative is uh, permanent impact to the environment, and that's just not something we're going to be doing. Kelly, anything to add, Kevin? I would just say that a lot of it's, the deployments are driven by the customer. So, you know, sure, for albuminus or something like that, maybe it's a donor who comes in and starts to look at a really area-wide deployment, um, looking at a large-scale reduction in a, in a pest species in a particular region. But a lot of this is 
customer focused. So it could be a mosquito district in the US who has a particular problem that they want to get rid of. And then they manage it the way that they want to. They get it to the level that they want to, and then they decide whether they're going to monitor and repeat treatment or use a different treatment or whatever they do. So it's customer driven in, in those cases. So case by case, I think, is the answer uh, and, uh, and, and highly variable as to, as, as, as to how that would play out. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Charles Bogo of the Panamfic Limus Good Control Association. Uh, my question is basically that, first of all, to say that your work is actually great, and we really appreciate that, working on IDC Egypti. And I think you have been working in Brazil for quite a long time, and have, definitely you have gotten some good uh, but was on, on to that. And one of the main questions is I'm asking is about the regulatory mechanisms, especially that you have hand with Brazil, and you are able to get it very quickly and be able to roll it out easily, even in at the community level. However, when you come to Africa, this is basically different because different countries have different regulatory mechanisms and they use it at different levels. So if you are going to law out the same thing in Africa, because it is Egypt and is actually a, a problem, how is it going to happen? Because definitely you are going to have problems, especially in regulatory mechanisms. You have heard about anti people who are actually against release of genetically modified products. And so that becomes a major problem. The other question I wanted to actually to ask is, uh, are you thinking of really working on ID, uh, an office in uh, uh, Gabi? Because that's a main factor, really, of malaria. We know IDS in Egypt is actually a major problem also in Africa, but it has not really been studied quite a lot. But it is actually a problem which can actually be explored even further. But I did, uh, I know for Gambi, which is a complex, and I know for this Vanessa, it's a complex. How is that going to be done? Mm. Are you thinking about that? And I'm actually uh, happy to hear that actually you have already started with an office Stevenson in Djibouti. And so, how is that going to happen? And considering uh, how GMOs things are actually taken into consideration and how that is going to take place. Yeah, yeah, great questions, both of them. Um, well, just to start on the, the regulatory question, um, I'll note a couple of things. Um, it did take us 10 years to, to secure approval in Brazil, 10 years of relationships and piloting and testing and presence. Um, and we were, we've been very lucky with the stewards of Brazil's biosafety regulatory regime. Very, very lucky that it's, it's a wonderful group of competent professionals. Um, and, but it's, it, I would argue that right now it's an outlier. Brazil is not the model that we would use necessarily for engaging in our first few uh, countries in, in Africa. Having worked on the African continent for 22 years of my career, um, we have a, a, a deep appreciation for the fact that um, we have to let our local partners or national and local or NMCP programs guide us into the countries. This is not us seeking to um, deploy a product whether or not uh, a certain African government wants us to be there. We're seeking to deploy our technology where there is need and where the government is asking us to come. So Djibouti is a wonderful example. We formed a, a wonderful partnership with, um, with the government there. Um, we've started that relationship, Kevin, I believe you and Neil, uh, in 2018 in Geneva at a Stevens Eye conference, one of the first convenings uh, you might remember. Um, and it took, uh, let's see, we're in year four of relationship building such that they appreciate and feel comfortable with um, how we form relationships, how we work, what the technology does, um, and the process by which we move a technology into a country. So we will meet African countries where they are and be respectful to their wishes to see a tool like this deployed. 
that will be our policy for as long as this team is here, and, and it really, it's the, it's the route to success. Other vectors, other malaria vectors, um, yeah, we're, we're asked quite often to consider developing additional pests. Uh, Funestis has been on our minds uh, and has been a, a topic of discussion. Um, I'll ask both Kelly and Kevin if they have any comments, but I will say in terms of how Oxitec selects technologies to build, because I, I would love to build every malaria vector and, and deploy them, we use somewhat of a, kind of a, an impact equation. So first, the pest has to be tractable from a biological standpoint, such that our approach works. Um, can we release males? Can they fly a certain distance? Can they find females? Are the mating behaviors such that we can make something that works? Not all malaria uh, vectors are suitable for our type of technology. Second is, can we rear them at scale? Because while we might be able to have Kelly's team build a strain, we may not be able to rear them at a, at a, you know, at a, at a level that makes sense. And then uh, finally, can we productize it or put it into deployable mechanisms that are efficient? I call it the pizza box, te uh, pizza box test. Really, we want nothing more complicated than a pizza box that you open and you put a little hot sauce on it or peri-peri sauce. Um, and uh, when you put all of those things together, a number of, we, we won't pursue a number of pests. But uh, I don't think these are the only two malaria pests that we'll pursue. Thoughts? Any quick thoughts, guys? No, I would say we've, like Gary said, we've been asked. Um, we're very interested. Uh, there is a lot of work in Gambia, and, and Stephen's Eye was kind of a, the orphan, you know, that needed attention. And so that's where we were asked to start. I think it's a great place to start. Um, complexes can be managed, just like the, you know, some of the gene drive guys are doing. And I think we could get on top of that. Rearing, especially with Nestis, would be a unique challenge. Um, but all of these things are things that we definitely would love to take on in future. So I think we'll, we'll go vector by vector and bring them on board as the, the right pull exists for us. I will say, we, um, a few of us were in Kigali at your event, uh, was it last month now? And um, it was a wonderful couple of days in, in Kigali with, with your colleagues. Um, the PAMCA uh, annual conference was really, really wonderful. And we were received very warmly. Uh, so it was great. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. This will be our last question because we're at the hour. Right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Megan Ullman. I'm from Monash University in Australia. And my question is, how long do your eggs last in that commercialized product? And is there anything you've done to, I guess, extend the shelf life of that? Sure. Yeah. So um, shippable products, we're looking at a minimum of a six week shelf life, um, target around 12 weeks. And when we produce eggs in the factory without packaging, we're looking about six months. So I think Egypti is uniquely suited to being dried and packaged and it's behaving well in our hands. Um, I, I think also our technology doesn't seem to impact egg lifespan. Um, so we get very, very good results. It's been, this colony has been, you know, in the lab for a long time. So I think we've also managed to select by using old egg batches, but um, I don't think we're relying on much more than the basic biology of Aedes aegypti. No magic there. Do you put a shelf life on the product when it's there? Of course. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You must be jet lagged uh, <laughs> considerably. So thank you for, for being up with us. May, might I say before we close? Oh, oh one, yes, sir. One, one more. I mean, the other thing, Egypti is ideal for this because the eggs will survive in the package for a long time. How long can you keep the Anopheles leg eggs before you have to hatch them? Watch this space. We're working yeah. on that. <laughs> Stand but, by. Stand yeah. by. But the, uh, the other question becomes one of, if you take Egypti, because for them, 100 yards is a long ways. If you release a bunch of these packages in a village, you control that village. If you were to take 80s Tinirinkus, which will fly 20 miles in a night, you know, 30 kilometers is a normal flight range for that thing, you could control every mosquito in your village today. Everyone is dead. You won't even notice it tomorrow because they'll be back in from 20 miles away. So your flight range just partially is the Anopheles vectors. Uh, because they have a greater flight range, you have to have a much larger area of control to get the control in that small area around the village. 
Yeah. I, again, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's one more. Okay. And then, one, yeah. Sorry, I, I apologize for sure. dragging this on. Um, I'm from the Caribbean. I'm, I'm Jamaican. And some of the things that we're, and I'm not a vec vector biologist, but some of the things we're tackling there in our universities is, is that we, we are a big tourist destination. We are the place that pandemics can rise and spread from. Um, so I just want to know what is your company's policy on those local scientists who are working on fundamental research questions like vector competence, um, how to break transmission, um, how to predict what's emerging as a potential pandemic or epidemic, um, and, and, and how would you engage with us as local scientists to, to, to answer those questions? Yeah, yeah, great question, thank you. Um, well, uh, going back to what I mentioned earlier, um, typically when we're working on the ground, we're doing so in partnership with government. Uh, and the, I don't think in any case I'm aware of, uh, with the exception now of the Brazil commercial launch, where we've operated independent of government. It's always arm in arm with government and by extension uh, with kind of the, the ecosystem of experts um, that combined to make up uh, the community of vector control and public health specialists. That is one of our kind of primary approaches to deploying our technology, and that is become partners with and aligned with and integrated with, in fact, um, with, with our local ecosystem of, of folks who really know what to do. We know our technology, but we don't necessarily have an expertise in the Jamaican vector control um, kind of, uh, you know, dynamic or state of play. And, um, you know, a great example, um, we are inside, in the Florida Keys, we are, we are literally nested inside the government facility. And we share a break room. Rajiv uh, is with us, he's one of our leaders here in the US. Um, you know, we, we have a wonderful team there, but we're completely integrated with the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District, which is, is really unique. Um, and something that we, we value greatly. Now, in terms of the academic and scientific communities, um, you know, we publish a lot. We, we are engaged in relationships with a number of, of uh, members of the community. We love being in places like this. Um, um, and our phone is always on. Um, Thanks very much. We, I mean, we have footprints in 17 territories in the Caribbean. Yeah. Thanks yeah. very much. Well, thank you all for joining us. I don't know if you all have any last parting thoughts before we close up. We appreciate your time this evening and hope you have a good night. But yep. any last thoughts? Just a, a big thank you maybe on our behalf. Dr. Neil Morrison is here. He's one of our longest standing employees from the very beginning back there, blue shirt. So thank you, Neil and, and Rajiv. Thank you for your help. Thank you, Bayer, for having us. Great to see so many old friends as well as new friends. Um, we'll make this available to ASTMH members, so in the case you want to dig in. Um, but I'll also note that the QR codes we were showing will get you to uh, a voluminous amount of information that we try to, to make public. So thanks for spending your Monday night with us. Trick or treat, happy Halloween, and um, we'll look forward to meeting you again. Thank you. Thank you.